a certain rawness about gravel excavations that offends a lot of people, but not this angler. As far as I'm concerned, this is where the future of trout fishing and much of our fishing lies for tomorrow. <clears throat> Morning. Hello, they've still got the pump working in this lake. I'm not so sure I like this grey day though, it's horrible. So perhaps the sun will get out later on, I hope so. Over there there's some small ducks diving. Can't quite see what they are from here. All along the margins here there's some super beds of willow herb and Norfolk reeds. It's absolutely packed with wildflowers. Right. Let's get those spotties. This is absolutely beautiful through here. All these lovely subtle colours and hundreds of wildflowers. Some smells and it really is a beautiful place just to be, actually, whether you're walking along with the fishing rod or not. It just shows you what Mother Nature can do in these marshlands and gravel pits, well away from intensified farming. Look, here's a lovely field thistle. There's a, I'll pull it gently. I might not just lodge that bumblebee. He's on the top of it at the moment. That's lovely. Just over there, there's some hemp agrimony. There's all these lovely grasses all over the place just here. And what about this colourful patch? We've got some blues and yellows here. We've got the, the tufted vetch. And we've got this pretty little marsh trefoil. It's a super little plant. And then here, this is, this is most unusual. This is the common toad flax. It's quite unlike any other yellow plant. And then across the stream there, which we can't actually see because there's so many beautiful uh, flowers. We've got some rose bay willow herb, and I think the willow herb is actually probably my favourite plant. Well, here we are at the pipe lake. That pump's making a hell of a noise there, and it's uh, it's draining that other huge lake in the distance there whilst they're finished digging it. That's going to be a lovely lake. You might have a look at that later on. There's not an awful lot coming off here, so I think what I'm going to do is use the hexagon whisker rod with a dry line and uh, change over flies. I think I'll put on one of, one of my heavily weighted butyl shrimps. I've got a long cast on and they'll get right the way down. the fish are obviously all the way down. Hello, we get a nice glimmer of sun coming through. Trout eating an awful amount of shrimps. And here's my butyl shrimp. It's tied with a strip of butyl pond liner as its back. And this withstands the abrasiveness of the trout's teeth. It's tied on a wide gate hook, could be eights, tens. And the hackle is a, is a, a sharp black cock hackle and the centre is black chenille. Killing lure, this. Right, let's go. That's lovely. Got a long cast on here, really. A bit too long for these reeds around here, but that's better. When you're trying to imitate a natural creature, there's nothing worse than these monotonous slow pulls. I like to give a little twitch every now and again, then a long pull, and then a little jerk, and then a pause, and then a couple, and a mini twitch, and then another little jerk. And often you can see the, the trout following this, and one little spurt like that, and a sudden little dart, and he'll take it, whereas these long, slow pulls like this, he just follows and follows and he may never take it. Well, 
while I'm working this shrimp on a long bow here against the back eddy, and I thought I just had a touch, but no, I think it's bobby weed. Normally you get really good stiff takes in this sort of drift. No. Hello, looks like old George, the digger driver, is going to turn the pump off any minute. Give us a bit of peace and quiet. Oh! <laughs> oh, that's lovely. That's music to my ears, that is. One of the nice things about fly fishing, with peace and quiet, it's beautiful. Oh, here we are. Goodness me. That took that shrimp on the drop there. Oh, and it's coming towards me very fast. It feels like a good fish. Oh, yes, it is a good fish. Whoa, oh, look at that. Oh, goodness me. This is one of the wonders of fly fishing, that super jump they make. Come on. Oh. Yes. Oh, beautiful. Oh, a lovely looking fish. Oh, oh. That's when they do those last minute dives. Oh, that is a good fish as well. Oh, super. Goodness me, that's a It's getting on for four pounds. A cockfish, that kite there. And the sh shrimp is just in the top jaw hinge. Oh, that's a nice looking fish. Where go my fingers? <laughs> Lovely. Well, we've been enjoying the gravel pit trout fishing here at Bure Valley Lakes. Let's have a look around and see how a fisher is actually made. Put the tackle down, I don't need that. Goodness me, I can see all the water belting in from that seam down there. This is such a high water table around here. If they didn't have that pump going whilst he was digging, most of it would be underwater. Mm. Well, here we are. I suppose this is about the, what's going to be the heart of the lake. It's a bit squelchy here. I don't think I shall walk too, too far. That's about it. It's quite a sobering thought, really, that probably less than a year's time, people will be catching fish from right where I'm standing now. I certainly I've grown one of them. The thing is, there's quite a lot of stone yet to come out. There's some very rich seams all along here. They're going to come out, but beyond me there, there's a... Um, I think they'll leave that island. It's mostly blue clay, and I don't think they'll bother to move that. Really, as the rivers and other fisheries in Britain slowly deteriorate, particularly the rivers through abstraction, I think this is the future we have in gravel pit fishing. This is why I think we've got to look after it and and plan these fisheries now. I think there's so much future, so much optimism to look forward to in our sport if, if anglers acquire pits such as these and, and make super fisheries out of them, not only for trout but other species as well. And for this, I think the future holds a, quite a lot of optimism. Mm -hmm. Most of this little stream bordering the, the lakes is rather overgrown, but there's a nice run on this bend here. Might be able to get a fly through. It's a bit overgrown, mine. Let's have a go. I've got a pheasant town ni nymph on, which is quite handy. We'll just have a go with this. 
It's a bit of wind here, isn't it? It's a bit of a... Goodness me, this wind's a problem. Let's try and lay one right down there. This is real botched stuff, this is. I can't really get a, a good casting at all. If there's anything there, they usually come quickly. No. Let's have another one. Ah, that's a better cast. Probably is I'm stuck on top of that willow herb there. Uh, come on, you little devils. On worms, these little brown trout can be the most gullible perishers going, but if you're fly fishing and you show yourself, then you don't stand a chance. Very difficult position to cast from this is. Oh, we're up the older. No, we're not, we're off again. <laughs> there we are, we're down again. Hanging over a thistle this time, but never mind. If we do get a take, it'll probably be quite violent. No, the river isn't, the stream isn't that fast at all. I was surprised back up there where it's a bit narrow, it's bucketing through. And here it's quite slow. Now I think I must have scared them. I don't think it's worth hanging around. Well, I fell miserably at the stream. Let's try the end of the lodge lake here. These are an interesting plant. One of the loveliest of waterside plants, they're called Himalayan balsam or jumping jack because when you touch their seed pods at this time of the year, it <laughs> jumps all over the place. Super plants. Hello, I know what you little devils want. Come on. I always carry a bit of bread when I come here and feed these. Come on. I don't know what these are, but I think they're a cross between a... Whoa, oh, that's my finger. <laughs> They're a cross between a, a mallard and a, an Indian runner. At least that's what Dave Green, the owner, says, but I don't know. Oh, dear me. <laughs> All right, there's enough for both of you here. Good, that looks as though there's a, a nice ripple coming down this end now. One or two fish starting to move. Super. Let's go on the other bank. Here's my selection of imitative patterns. We've got all the buzzers there, the midge pupas. Got dragonfly, damselfly, larvies, a whole range of pheasant tails which represent quite a few different types of nymphs. And we've got some sedge sedges there. We've got the polystickles which represent sticklebacks. And over here we've got a whole range of little tiny and large shrimps, leaded shrimps, the sedges, corixas, which are the water boatmen. And here's my selection in different types of colours of the leaded mayfly nymphs. Probably one of the most effective patterns that I use, particularly in this fluorescent green. Let's tie one of these now. Well, here we are with the outside setup. I've got the spade firmly in the ground and the vise on the spade. I've already got a size 10 long shank hook in the vise. And I've already put the weighted part in the back. I'll just put a little more dope on it to, to secure it. And I start the nymph by putting in the tail feathers. Three fibres, we've got four there, I don't think it really matters. We'll tie them in, this forms the tail of the nymph. Then next comes the ribbing, which we tie in, an, in exactly the same spot. Right down to the end there. And then next the fluorescent green body wool. 
we'll start at the just beyond the weighted part there that gives a nice even run down and tends to bind that in nicely then we go back to the pheasant's feather they're good pheasant's feathers they play such a large part in fly tying make so many different flies from them in so many different variations and we tie this in once we've gone back to the head halfway down the weighted part and in a minute this is going to form the wing cases as we wind it back and we start off by coming backwards with the luminous rather fluorescent whirl which is sometimes difficult and seem to spring all over the place nice tight coils coming forwards here let me just tie that off hasn't got to be too neat there I'm a terribly messy fly tire anyway now we come forwards in the opposite direction clockwise to lock in the wool so that it doesn't come undone after one or two trout these represent the segments of the body and again just tie that off put a half hitch over that for a second cut the remainder off now we bring the pheasant fibres forwards tie them in tightly to represent the wing cases cut those off short and we separate them and then tie over that to form a nice big insect looking head and I don't use a whip finish tool or a whip finish type knot I just use three half hitches because by the time I've put some dope on and then later on two or three coats of head varnish you don't really need it I can never ever remember having one of my heads come undone like this There we are, the Lady Mayfly Nymph, which if tied in this fluorescent green wool is one of the most effective imitative patterns I know. Right, flying to the teeth of it now. That's better, much better. About a few seconds to sink. Hello, there's a little fish moving just to my left there. And another one. They seem to be in very close here. Kind of a cast parallel. Here we are, we're in. I was just going to say I'm going to have a cast parallel to the shoreline. Oh, that's a good fish. That's going well. Come on, it's one of those wallowers. It stays on the surface and won't get his head down. Oh, he has now. Then they wake up and they start fighting. That's a nice fish. Well, it's going now. Go! <laughs> I'm treading on the line here. I think I'm getting out of the way, otherwise I'm going to lose this one. <laughs> what I like about rainbow trout. You think they're acrobats? Come on, here we go. Can't lose him in the rushes. No, he's off again. Goodness me. Got a lot of power, this fish. I think I play him a little bit too hard, really, but I like to enjoy the struggle. There we are. I think he's ready now. Well, I'm going to net you anyway. <laughs> oh, that's a good fish. Oh. Oh, that's lovely. That's close on three pounds. A lovely silver rainbow. Look at that. Beautiful fish. Sometimes it seems a, a shame to kill them, but part of our ticket here is 
is a meal at the end of the day, and I think we'll probably end up smoking this one. There we are. A couple of sharp blows, and he's he's ready. There's the mayfly nymph just in the corner of the jaw hinge there. Go on, that's in. There we are. I think I'll take a photograph of this while he's lying there. Let's arrange the rail. I think I'll put a sprig of willow herb in as well. That add a nice bit of colour to it. One of my fishing is, is surrounded by photography and I, it's part of my day's enjoyment really. Let's have a go for that. That's a nice looking shot. Lovely. Hi, Dave. Hello, John. You had anything yet? I had a couple, but uh, this breeze is a bit variable, isn't it? Well, yes, but if there wasn't a ripple on the water, you'd only complain anyway. Oh, I know. Where are you off to? Just going up to the top to feed these small fish in the stew up there. Hey, you've got some triploids there, haven't you? Yes, I have. They're all triploids for next year. Well, can I come and have a look? I'll have a few more casts and uh, join you, if yes, I Yes, by all means. It'll take me a minute or two to get up there anyway. I'll see you later. Okay, Dave. Bye. Bye for now. Goodness me, Dave. How many are you going there? Well, uh, around about 15,000, give or take some. They're rather hard to count, as you can see. Yeah, goodness me. Are they all triploids? Yes, these are all triploids. We're uh, not having any male or female next year at all. Yeah. How, do, how do you produce the triploid trout then? Well, shortly after the eggs are uh, laid, they're subjected to a heat shock and the sex genes are the most vulnerable and they're destroyed, leaving the rest of the fish entirely normal. The object is that uh, you don't want the fish to waste energy in producing eggs and milk since they're never going to reproduce. Right. And they grow that much faster and they stay in condition all year round. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's a good point. You don't have the, the problem with the cocks chasing the females in the spring and things like that, do you? Well, that's true. And now the trout fishing season in some places goes all the year round, it's important that the fish should stay in good condition. Yeah, yeah. I should look forward to catching these next year when you put them in the new lake when it's ready? Well, if everything goes well, these should be weighing about a pound and a quarter by next staple. Sure. Super. Well, about an hour ago, I filleted a rainbow of about four pounds, and I've got two big fillets here in the smoke. This is still quite warm, actually. There we are. Look at that, beautiful. I always wrap these in clean chicken wire. And I can unravel it. It stops the fillet falling to bits, really, because they're, they're very, very soft. There we are, look at that. Fit for a king. Beautiful. Let's take it a nice chunk. I think I like trout cooked in this way better than anything else. Mm. Little pepper. Got a few battered rolls in here. Let's see what this is like. Mmm. Now this is part of the magic of trout fishing. 